Good afternoon. My name is Dyke Hendrickson, and this is Life Along the Merrimack. We talk about the history of the Merrimack River and the health of the Merrimack River. And sometimes we <clears throat> bring in people who work on the Merrimack River. And today our guest is Bill Tapley, who is uh, a local captain here, runs a tourist boat, and has much experience here in the community. Bill, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. And one of my first questions is, it's since it's spring, although it's also 40 degrees, it doesn't feel like spring. But have you started your season yet? And talk a little about your boat. Where is it located and what kind of services does it offer? Okay, we're located in the central waterfront right down at smack dab in the middle of the city at the embayment area. Uh, I run six trips a day, three upriver and three down to the state reservation. And we try to give you a little bit of uh, history and ecology of the area. And uh, the trip lasts an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, for some years you were trying to get a boat taxi, which would go from Newburyport um, to the reservation over oh. across the river in Salisbury. Sure. Now that has come to fruition. That has come to pass, and that's great. Uh, 19 years it took me to get that <laughs> permission from the state. To, a little slow, to say the least. However... Thanks to Representative Kelkos. He really went to bat to have that happen. There are thousands of people over there in the summer, and they go swimming in the ocean, of course. do I guess some of them might say, hey, why don't we go over to Newburyport? We can take the boat over. Is that, you know, the, the scheme that you have going? That's it. Well, I picked them up. Uh, they're on the water for an hour, and I give them a little bit of history and ecology and uh, drop them off in Newburyport, and I spend two hours in Newburyport to do whatever they wish, eat, dine, whatever. And uh, this is the first year. The first part of the season worked out very well. But mid-season, I had to go to the hospital for a little, <laughs> <laughs> a little problem. And I was down for about three weeks in the middle of the season. And I think probably somebody down there said, I think the guy died. <laughs> you know, never came back. And well, it, well, they say all publicity is good publicity. So sure, maybe uh, your, sure. name, <laughs> your name got around. Um, what it's hard, might be hard to generalize, but where do the guests come from? Are they from Quebec? Are they from Westboro? Or wh where do the people Quite come from? Thing. It seems to me that the people come back year after year after year, and I say year after year, 10, 15 years in a row. Uh, families uh, all over the North Shore, but many from Canada. Yeah. And then are they all camping, or you might have somebody who's staying at a motel, drives the car down to oh, swim? Oh, I doubt that. No, they're all camping, and, and you know, they range from, you know, $100,000 rigs down to a tent, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the vacation for many of those people down there, just right there in the water. Well, that, that, that's a beautiful beach, as we know. Um, when you do take your uh, vessel out, how long is it, and what's the horsepower and that type ah. of thing? Well, the vessel I have now, and I've had four over the years. This is my 40th year, I guess. Uh, this one here is, uh, came off a Coast Guard cutter. They usually have four or five of these along the side of a large 120-foot uh, ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the big one sinks, they get in these to go home. It's called a motor surf vessel. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one's only six passengers. It's a small the vessel, uh, 120 horsepower and uh, a diesel engine. You know, I took the trip once, and I thought it was, you know, really interesting, particularly the environmental elements. And one of the uh, attractions to me was hearing about the Great Marsh. Um, yeah. A lot of people, and I include myself in that, are not so aware of, we have the largest marsh in New England. And mm -hmm. is that one of the things that you talk about and the value of the marsh? We, we do, and... Uh, <clears throat> It's 125, uh, it's 25,000 acres from Gloucester all the way to New Hampshire. And um, unfortunately, uh, we've been invaded by several invasive species and it's kind of killing off some of our natural plants, you know. Uh, for example, uh, the monarch butterfly and its migratory path, path going through here has to, the main diet is uh, goldenrod. And I think it's either the... Uh, uh, pepperweed or some other plant that's an invasive species is choking it off. So when that happens, there goes the golden well, that's too there bad. goes the morning <laughs> butterfly, you know. How about the green crab? I, they're a menace, are they not? Uh, yeah, the, uh, I'm not so familiar with that, but in recent times I understand that it's causing a lot of problems with the uh, uh, 
uh, clams, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, that's quite the industry for Ipswich in particular and, and Newbury in mm-hmm. those areas. What are some of the uh, birds that you see? As I recall, there are, uh, you know, egrets, of course, but there are osprey there uh, as well. Are there's there osprey, there's egrets. There's uh, one time I remember going through the marsh in a very shallow area, and it was a, a sandhill crane. The thing wow. must have been six feet tall, you know, scared the daylights out of me, opened up the wings, you know. Uh, yeah, so uh, th- supposedly there's uh, willets, there's all kinds, but uh, 350 species of birds that uh, mm-hmm. migrate to that particular spot. Well, one of the uh, things that is mo- most interesting in this area are the seals. How are the seals mm-hmm. doing these days? I don't know if, it, if it's ebb and flow with them, but you know, do you see in the summer, do you see yeah, a number of seals few, out there? Yeah, for sure. There's quite a few seals down there at... Uh, Black Rocks, Badger Rocks, uh, just off of the state reservation. Yeah. And wh- I read about this. I've never seen um, a shark or a, a fish that large. But as I understand, the shark and the seals uh, do not coexist too well. Yeah. In other words, <laughs> the seals might disappear if the sharks are around. Have you seen sharks, or is that no. a semi-myth here? Uh, well, uh, they say that uh, one had come up the river, you know, a rather sizable shark here not too long ago, a couple of years ago or something like that. But uh, I don't know how many people substantiated that claim. But uh, not so much around here, certainly not in the river, but uh, down on the Cape, a big problem with the seals. There's so many seals in the, in the islands down there that the sharks are really congregating. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the other uh, fish that used to be a staple here was a sturgeon. Oh, yeah. And I mention this because I was just walking down a Cashman Park the other day, and there was one of those explainers there that uh, talked about sturgeon and sure. how they used to be quite a significant uh, presence here in the Merrimack River. Mm-hmm. Are sturgeon still around? I, I just don't know the answer yeah, to well, that. Uh, uh, I only know what I read in the paper, whoever said that. Uh, Be careful of that, Bill. I mean, (laughs) seriously. I I was with the Daily News for six years, and be careful about that. Uh, It it seems that they are coming back. But, uh, you know, you you go back a couple of hundred years ago. There were sturgeons in the river, four or five hundred pounds. You know, there was nothing like that now, but uh, uh, that was quite unique. So I'm talking with Bill Tapley, who is a captain of a tourist boat on the waterfront. The season is just about opening. He's also a longtime teacher, and uh, when he takes his vessel out, there's a lot of discussion of the environment. So one of the things when we talk about the environment, Bill, is the question of the, you know, the cleanliness of the river. Uh-huh. And there have been numerous stories uh, recently that some of the sewage treatment plants upriver get a great deal of water, um, it, uh, the rainwater goes into the sewage treatment plant, mm-hmm. and then there's a discharge because the plant can't absorb it all. Yeah. Do you see a difference uh, in terms of the quality of the river? You know, when I, th- when I think back on that, when I was a kid, I grew up in Lowell, and we used to swim in the canals up there. We never, <laughs> we never knew the color of the water until we got there, you know, with the dyes and so on. But back in 1972, they passed the Clean Waters Act, and uh, with that, uh, the river came back to life. It was quite polluted at the time with the the mills running full force. But now, here in recent times, uh, just before the spillage of the millions of gallons of raw sewage into the river here, uh, the river was going downhill again uh, in the sense that uh, there was a lot of building along the river, taking down trees, yeah. the filtration <clears throat> of the water. and uh, So it was coming to be a problem even before the spillage over the sewage treatment plants. But that's that's an issue that needs to be fixed. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a sadness that it's getting so bad. Yeah, well, that's a good explanation. And, you know, the Merrimack River went, runs 120 miles, mm-hmm. uh, well past um, Manchester, New Hampshire. So part of the river is quite clean and vibrant. And, and as you know, the, the river has had an extraordinary history because, as you alluded to, yeah. the textile mills Absolutely. of late 1890s in that area um, were great for the economy, they, and immigrants, uh, many immigrants, as you know, coming from Lowell, uh, settled in that area. Sure. So maybe, you know, if it could be cleaned up once, which it was, as you say, in the 70s with uh, Ed Muskie, Senator Ed Muskie from Maine, and later mm-hmm. George Mitchell, perhaps um, 
you know, there can be some important uh, work done in it now. Well, it's going to take billions of dollars because we're talking about all of the major cities along the river, the 250 uh, towns along the river, you know, uh, as they have sewage treatment plants, however, they just can't handle the capacity. You know, the question comes to mind, uh, uh, when they passed that Clean Waters Act and they forced all of the cities and towns to clean up their act, uh, and then they passed the law saying that the runoff waters had to go through the sewage treatment plant. Weren't they thinking that mm-hmm. the, the, the capacity of the sewage pl- treatment plant couldn't handle all of that? Uh, so what to do now, I don't know. It's, it's going to cost a tremendous amount of money, and, and people need to step up the plate and vote in favor of putting mm-hmm. some money in that place. And I think it's a topical issue because um, the overflows are increasing in frequency, in part, they say, because uh, because of climate change, we're getting more bursts of rain, um, maybe not more rain per se, but we're certainly having large bursts of it. And so I agree, and most people think, you know, the towns can't do it, and the state likely can't do right. it. So it seems like, as in the early 70s, a federal effort is called for. And as I understand it, um, you know, the Watershed Council here in Essex County is trying to work with it but it'll take a lot of a lot of people working yeah, together a commission be informed now to try to uh, see what they can do about cleaning it up and a representative of the Calcos just went down to Washington this past week here I think uh, in trying to raise some money to, to get that done well that's good to know yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that when you take out your vessel um, and you sometimes you go up the river sometimes you go down the river do you go outside the jetties no not at all uh, over the years, the run tours, I'd, uh, run a good ecology tour down through the marshes, over to Ipswich, through Raleigh and back. I've done that m- for many years, but you know now I notice that uh, the silting in of the Plum Island River mm-hmm. is dramatic. I mean, I couldn't believe. I just went down there yesterday, and uh, you could usually go through there probably an hour and a half either side of the tide and not hit bottom. But now you'd be hard pressed to get in and out within an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, quite dramatic. Is that is that a natural circumstance? I would think so. I would think so. Uh, the ebb and flow uh, depends on you know, how much water we get in the river to push things here and there. Yeah, one of the things is um, it's always been said that the Merrimack River is tough to uh, navigate. Mm-hmm. And as you say, the tide is an important element. Um, do you hear that from time to time? I hear that, you know, people with a new boat or they've never been to Newburyport, they come out. And remember that the uh, tide could be coming in. The current could be, of course, goes towards the east. It, it must be a challenge from time to time. It's quite dangerous. <clears throat> and you've got to pick your times uh, depending upon the size of your boat, you know, uh, particularly because of a, northwest, a northeast wind, a low tide and a sandbar that runs halfway across the mouth of the river. Many times we can get a 10-foot burst of waves in the, right at the mouth of the river. So if you're running out there in a little 16-foot skiff, uh, you ought to have your head examined. Right. <laughs> you know? I, I've heard that many times. And the Coast Guard, um, from time to time, uh, is called because, well, for, for all the above reasons, sure. either people haven't been through it or yeah. they turn over in the heavy waves and that type of thing. So yeah. it seems like it's a challenge. We've lost some people in the river over the years uh, because at low tide they go out in these sandbars and uh, and they don't realize that they can get cut off uh, from the mainland and get stuck on a sandbar and then the current's coming down five or six knots, blow them out to sea. <laughs> well, one thing that I'm always amazed at when we talk about the river, um, Newburyport was the leading shipbuilding community and Samuel Elliott Morrison who was really the dean of historians of the 20th mm-hmm. century actually has that in a book that I I got up at all at oldies for small money recently 10 bucks an original <laughs> I, love I loved that. it but there it was uh, you know right there it wasn't you know Salem it wasn't Portsmouth or even Boston we were number one and I think that has to do with the fact that the river is 120 miles into the forest and we right. had a good supply of uh, timber have you ever heard that yeah, that's the truth uh, it seems that uh, we depleted all the, the lumber in the area because of the shipbuilding here in Newburyport and then with the onslaught of the steel ship you know the economy started to die in terms of the shipbuilding but I'm led to believe at one time we had about uh, 
uh, 73 uh, ships being built in Newburyport with only 2,300 <laughs> residents, you know. And that was before the tea and the uh, train, before, so you couldn't, sure, yeah. you couldn't get workers. So, And that always amazes me, and um, I don't think people recognize how vibrant the town was. Unbelievable. And also we're the birthplace of the Coast Guard, as you know. And one reason we are is because uh, we were the first uh, community to build a ship for what's now the Coast Guard. It was the Massachusetts, sure. 1790. It was built here in town. Um, and it, they built 10 that year um, when Hamilton, uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, convinced George Washington to do that. So one of the things that I don't think everyone realizes, we are the birthplace of the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And also we had a remarkable industry of shipbuilding. And it must have been full employment in those full days, Bill. Sure. I mean, someone made, you know, the sails, someone made the rudders, and there were great woodworkers here. And as I understand it, one reason why the uh, houses on High Street are so beautiful is a lot of people worked with wood, and that was, you know, their job, and they made beautiful houses and kitchens because they were used to making ships. How did you get involved in being a captain? I know you were an educator, a school teacher for many years. When did you take to the water? Oh, many years ago, in the 50s, actually. Now, we're not talking about swimming in Lowell. No, Taking no, to no. the water here is getting <laughs> no. into a vessel. Yeah. Uh, I went to the University of Alabama, and I had a... How, how did, why did you do that from Getting Lowell? out of the Army there. You know, uh -huh. next, so. But I had a friend there that lived on the Cape, and uh, while going to school, uh, I went to the Haverhill Trade School, by the way, and uh, getting out of uh, the summer vacations from uh, the university, I went down to the Cape to work, you know, hot dog stands mm -hmm. or whatever. And at that time, I built an a, a, a advertising float. And I used to advertise the local restaurants and things up and down the Cape at Craigsville Beach. And I even, back in those days, I even circled the... Uh, uh, President Kennedy's honey fits oh, with, really? with my ugly looking uh, <laughs> uh, boat, you know. But those were great days. That's how I got started in boating, I guess. What do people like about your trip? I mean, is it getting out on the water on a hot day? Or do they, and you give a great presentation, and I learned a lot. Um, but is it the education or the naturalism or what do people like? It's the water. You know, it's like going back to the womb. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I love being on the water. People love being on the water, you know, and it's, there's always change, you know, whether the wind is blowing or no wind at all. And it's, it's always exciting. And when you were teaching, um, did you teach the environment per se or did your knowledge of, you know, the environment and the maritime come a little later? Uh, well, I, I was a science teacher. Uh, we broke classes up into various different uh, uh, academic endeavors, and uh, I was a science teacher for many years in elementary school, and uh, one of my uh, units uh, was on ecology and uh, tried to introduce kids to that uh, at such a young age, you know, 10, 11 years old. Where did you teach, Bill? I think um, you, you didn't have a 40-year career at one school, as some people do. Yeah. What are some of the communities in which you taught? Well, I started out from the University of Alabama. I started teaching in Monterey, Mexico. Oh, what a natural segue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I enjoyed that. And then after coming back from that, I, I taught in Long Island. I had a brother teaching there as well. And then I got an invitation from a friend from Monterey, Mexico, uh, who was becoming the director of the American School in uh, Puebla, Mexico. Large school, 2,300 students. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to go down to become principal of the secundaria, which is... Uh, How was your Spanish? I've got to think you had some Spanish. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I went down there. No, no lessons in Spanish, just blank. And, uh, but you learn quick enough. You speak with the people and you pick it up. And of course, obviously, my grammar is horrendous, but uh, I can communicate. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, had a similar situation early in my career. I was a reporter and uh, an editor copy editor on the Mexico City News. Oh. And so that's an English-speaking newspaper, but sure. nevertheless, you know, someone calls up with a tip, you have to kind of know what they're talking about. Or someone calls up and, you know, I've just sent a press release over, can you translate it and get it in? And so, <laughs> but I know what you mean. Sometimes sure. you, th you think you know a few things, but uh, when you're in it every day, it can be challenging. And then what are, you also taught in Massachusetts, uh, Bill. Can, I think you were in Ipswich. Can I you talk a little I about that? I was in Ipswich, loved it, been there <clears throat> 30 years. And uh, 
I taught the fifth and sixth grade there. Now, I asked about a friend of mine. I think you know him as well, and this is a local show, and his name is Jack Welch. He was a teacher and coach there for many years. You knew Jack, did you not? Great, great guy. I love Jack. Yep. He did well. He brought those teams uh, to state champions year after year after year. He was a football coach for you listeners, and Ipswich was usually the smallest school in the, you know, in the, whatever league they were in. But Jack Welch, uh, who still lives here in town on High Street, and yes. has his own tennis court, which uh, I go by <laughs> oh, and, and look at very enviously because I'm a tennis player. But I, but I have played there. Uh, one of the things about the river, though, um, in recent years, let's say the last decade, there's a lot of recreational boating on the river. As I understand, Paul Hogg, the, the uh, harbor master, uh, registers about 1,500 vessels just in Newburyport. Right. Of course, you have Amesbury, Salisbury, Haverhill. So that must be a change if you look at, say, over a decade or so. Well, you know, to tell the truth, when I first came here, uh, they were just putting the docks in at the Central Waterfront, uh, in the establishment of the Newburyport Redevelopment Authority, you know. And uh, there might have been eight moorings in the river, no, mm -hmm. maybe one marina. <laughs> now we have five marinas before you go a mile. And uh, it's really increased, yeah. hasn't it? <clears throat> I'm talking with Bill Tapley, who is a longtime resident, a teacher, educator, um, lives in Newburyport. And he has a vessel that goes out. Um, when do the real, the, the real tourist season start, Bill? I mean, you mentioned you've just, you kind of went out, but it's been very cold and windy. And yeah. what, what are your big times, July and August? Usually kick uh, July and August for sure. But it usually starts around Memorial Day weekend. You know, people get out and they can't wait for the sun to come out. And uh, that's usually when it starts. The, the state pier, state uh, docks down there at Salisbury Reservation won't go in until the 20th uh, of May. How many people do you think are in Salisbury in a hot weekend? I, yeah. You know, it looks very crowded, but I don't have a number on it. I, I'm, I'm led to believe there's a 1,000 people there, and, and they keep rolling over every two weeks. Uh, can't stay any longer than two oh, really? weeks, I guess. So we're talking about, <laughs> you know, 100,000 people maybe. I don't know how many people go through <laughs> that. There. That is a lot. And when you do take people out in the river, how far up the river do you go? You don't go to Haverhill, of course. Do you go to the chain bridge or what? Yeah, I, I go up to a uh, low boat shop right now. I used to go up beyond that, but uh, to keep it to an hour, I go to, as far as the low boat shop up, and in, that, up in Amesbury. Yeah, uh, that's been a staple here for many years, and they're still making boats. They are. And since 1773 <laughs> unbelievable well that, you know one of the stories you talked about low tide before we're getting a tall ship here yeah in newburyport in a couple of weeks but when the last one that i remember was el galeon right. a spanish vessel and um that you know drew about 16 feet and i remember that um uh, it kept cat tacking off of plum island once it arrived and all the youngsters and the families had gone out there uh, waiting for it to come in and you know it just took a long time and so when they did get here and I did interview the captain mm -hmm. was a 42 year old lady and she was the only a lady captain at the time in this in this company's fleet she said I did not want to come in at anything but high tide Absolutely. because if my vessel had been hung up on a sandbar and as you know Newburyport can have moving sandbars, you know, what was sure. here, what wasn't there last year, could be here this year. She said I was just, you know, w refused to come in and, and have a bad time of it. But that was an exciting moment. Do um, you remember tall ships here uh, over the years? I remember uh, the Spirit of Massachusetts came in one time. I forgot what they drew in terms of draft, but uh, I knew they got hung up at the icebreaker, which is down about a mile from the center of the uh, boardwalk. And uh, they came in at high tide, but the uh, tide wasn't very large that <laughs> time of the year. And I guess uh, they have stuck for a while. Well, it's amazing. I, one reason why the Newburyport uh, shipbuilding industry declined is just that reason. The ships got heavier, and then when, when, when they went to iron and steel, they got very heavy, and they just you know, couldn't come in and out anymore. If, if it got out, it could never come back if it was laden with cargo. And so I think in addition to the way 
everything changed in the industry. We, we couldn't build the iron chips because they uh, took too much water. Yeah, I, I remember uh, the story of the Alliance, which uh, built all the way up in Amesbury. I mean, I, I think about it when I go down the river. Says, There's not much water in there now, but how in the world could those you know, tall sailing ships ever get out of here? Uh, they had to really plan the tide. I mean, they, they didn't have a half an hour either the side of the tide in order to get out, I swear. That alliance was quite a vessel. Uh, it, it became the uh, built in Alliance Park there in mm -hmm. Amesbury and uh, became the flagship for John Paul Jones mm. during the War of 1812. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, one of the ships, the last tall ships that I remember in Newburyport was the Bounty. Yes. And that was um, a vessel built in 1960 for mm -hmm. the movie Mutiny on the Bounty with right. Marlon Brando. And it had been a tourist attraction in Fall River, among other places, New Bedford and that area. And it had been refitted in the fall of 2012 up in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. And then it came down, I think it was here, I th it was in Gloucester as well. And, you know, you can go on the vessel and meet everybody. And as you recall, Bill, uh, it went out to New London, Connecticut uh, for a few days and it was going to Florida, but it caught Hurricane Sandy. Right. That was a tragedy was and, a and one tragedy. You, you think that it might have been avoided. Yeah, well, it was my understanding that they should have known better to go out in a hurricane with the hurricane pending, you know. Uh, you know, the last tall ship built here in Newburyport was the Edith Symington, 125 oh, yes. feet up there in Courier Boatyard, I guess, mm -hmm. 1910. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's a picture in my book. The book is Nautical Newburyport, and it shows what a big day it was when yeah. the ship was finished. Oh, sure. Kids would get out of school. Uh, the women, you know, would dress up and bring lunch down. And, I, you know, yeah. I make a differentiation between women because women really did not work in the yards in those yeah. days. They might today, but they did not then. But what a big day it was. And those ships were so large and, um, you know, as you know, went all over the world. Yeah, true. Mostly sold off to England. We, we sold a lot of the ships out to England at the time. Yeah, and, yeah, and so I do remember that. And uh, it was one of uh, the last large ones built here. Um, and the bounty, as I was just to, to finish the sentence, they did save. So the bounty goes down off of North Carolina. There were 16 crew. The Coast Guard went out there and was a, were able to save 14. Yeah. Now, they never found the captain, and they uh, found a young woman named C Candace um, Fletcher, and she was a distant relative of Fletcher Christian. And so oh, really? they found, yeah, so uh, that was, they found her, but they weren't able to save her. But four, the Coast Guard saved 14 out of yeah. 16, 50, 50 knot uh, winds and high seas. So. That was one of the great Coast Guard rescues. Do you, do you uh, interact with the Coast Guard, Bill, or uh, hopefully not? Yeah, no, well, no, no. Although a, a couple of years back, they rescued me. Really? Yeah, uh, I was running down through the marsh there, you know. And when you go in early in the season, uh, before the, uh, the reeds start to grow, I mean, you have to read the, read the reeds to find out where you're going to go in the channel, you know. But uh, I remember one year, uh, it was kind of early in the season, I guess, and the reeds hadn't come up for me to find out which way to go. And I ran up on a hummock. Huh. And uh, so I called the Coast Guard. <laughs> they came in and pulled me out of there. And, and Mike Goodrich uh, of uh, Freedom Boat, uh, great guy. Uh, he's, he's saved a lot of people from sinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking to Bill Tapley. This is Life Along the Merrimack. We talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River. But, you know, on that topic, uh, you know, he does save a lot of people. Uh, and one of the things about it is the Coast Guard doesn't go out as much as they used to to save, you know, if you run out of gas or you lose a rudder. No, they'll, they'll come out and they'll check on you, make sure everyone's safe. But since 9-11, they've been caught up more in security elements. And so the old days of the Coast Guard towing someone home might just about be over. Yeah, they, they rely on uh, people like uh, Boat U.S. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to go out and for the rescue. Uh, well, this has been great. Um, this is Dyke Hendricks. I'm talking with Bill Tapley. Uh, the season of boating on the river and the ocean is just about coming up. And just uh, in a couple s 
seconds that we've got le- left. What brings you back to boating each year? What what makes you love you it know, and go I, out each year? I have been the luckiest guy in the world. You know, they say that uh, if you enjoy what you're doing, it's not work anymore. <laughs> and I had two great hits, yeah. teaching and boating. Well, that's great. Okay, we are finished for the day. Bill Tapley, thank you very much for coming. Uh, The season is starting. I hope everybody enjoys the ocean and the river this summer. Thank you for being here.